Hello. So I hope you are all as excited as I am to start deeping dive in uh, on the discussions and the panels that we have today. Uh, my name is Karina Veloso. I'm a Global Executive MBA student at INSEAD, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all here today. Uh, so our first session is um, Why Brazil? Seizing Brazil's Climate Potential, uh, where we will further explore the aspects about Brazil highlighted in the opening speeches that we just heard. It aims to facilitate a fact-based uh, discussion on Brazil's opportunities and set the overall framework for today. We will discuss uh, why do we believe Brazil is well positioned to be a hub for net zero solutions and uh, contribute to global decarbonization. We will also ask ourselves the question, uh, in which sector do we believe uh, these competitive advantages are the most significant? And also looking forward, uh, where we can help the global community and where do we need help? Uh, the panel will have two parts. Uh, to start the conversation today, we have the moderator, Arthur Ramos, um, Managing Director and Partners at Beach CG and member of Brazil Climate Summit Executive Team, who will share with us some learnings from the reporting BCG is uh, launching today. Uh, the report's called the Brazil Climate Change, uh, sorry, Brazil Climate Report 2024. Uh, the report is already available uh, for download at BCG uh, website and will be also added to our website as well. So please welcome Artur. Thank you very much, Karina. Bonjour, Madame, Monsieur. The pleasure being here. Very good to, to have the speech. As, as Karina mentioned, I'll be the moderator of this session. They asked me also to do a presentation uh, or a short presentation on this report that will also allow us to to engage in the discussion today, and I want to be—I try to be brief here on uh, several pages and slides that we need to show. But uh, you know, it's really amazing being here. Uh, and uh, it's about two years. George mentioned we started discussing the the opportunity of creating an environment to discuss to bring the narrative of uh, Brazil as a hub of solutions and speaking directly to inv to investors. So that was our main, our main objective, our main idea that we had in this, in this session, in this, uh, in this period. And, uh, and uh, no, on behalf of the, being part of the organization, on behalf of them, thanks everybody, but thanks especially the HSA and NCAD students here that made this happening. As, as George mentioned, that was on, a, on what we call the magic time. That's the, the time we don't have and we need to create, and we create marvelous things with, with that, okay. Uh, so uh, I don't know if we can, uh, project uh, the slides here. Ah, uh, okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank. So uh, I, I think that the main the main message here, the w what we want to to convene here, and of course I, I won't be starting here. And uh, Ambassador mentioned that you going to see the situation, the the tragic moments and and, and aspects that that we have related to to climate, and uh, and really really uh, focus on the on the areas. Uh, Part of the things we try to understand here, try to bring to you here is how do we see the key and, and you know, levelizing a little bit of the understanding on how we see the opportunities in Brazil. How do we see the advancements, the recent advancements, how do we see the frameworks, legislative advancement, and, and at the end of the, the, f the meaning of having uh, a lot of events uh, happening in Brazil, like G20 and COP30, as the ambassador was mentioning. First, and, and I know sometimes maybe for you, but we always start mentioning about uh, the different profile that we have in, uh, in Brazil related to emissions. Okay, uh, if you talk about most of the development world, the issue that we have: 70% of you know, more than two thirds of emissions are related to to energy, basically power generation, transportation, industrial use of energy. In our case, we have a situation that is the, uh, quite the opposite. 70% is related to agriculture, forest, land use. So this is a, a little bit of a, a different context, different situation. Uh, all, all the times we mentioned about that, we mentioned the importance of addressing those key issues. And they are stubbornly constant, okay? This is something that in the last few years, you take the gross and you take the, the net uh, level emissions. Brazil keeps on that. Uh, uh, on, on, uh, around that, uh, that percentage of 75% of gross emissions. This is the fifth largest emitter, emitter of, of in the world, even though, as we see, we have several of the advantages in terms of the renewable generation. 
why, why do you have those advantages? And, uh, and I think we have a lot of benefits related to nature. The, those benefits of nature relate to very competitive biofuels, uh, wind, solar. We have the hydro uh, that we explore. Uh, a lot of here integrated system in Brazil. Uh, this gives us uh, many opportunities also to providing uh, potentially uh, green derivatives like green ammonia, green methanol uh, going forward, and also on a reforestation cost very competitive on that. So this is a, a little bit of the, of the point when you say Brazil is a climate hub, a lot of the solutions are there and how we can explore them. Uh, we, this, this report, we, we prepared that two years ago. This is a little bit of the update we, we had uh, on that, okay? But we always start, this is a Nirvana situation, okay, that Brazil could have. Of course, leading uh, as an offset supply of, of CO2, uh, zero legal deforestation, this is a must. And I think my panelists here are going to be, be talking about that, but I think the, the idea of that. We, we mentioned about renewables potential like wind, solar, that will drive hydrogen uh, development uh, in Brazil or new energies in general on that. Uh, sustainability of agriculture, a lot of maintaining the, the resources in water, those kind of things are very, very important. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit about the potential of regenerative agriculture and also uh, a case study here, a summary of the case study related to recovering the degraded land. Biomass is another thing uh, not very well understood. A lot of prejudice related to how the biomass potential has in terms of uh, providing uh, solutions, particularly for the energy sector. So, so, so many of the of the areas, and, and this would lead also to, in our vision, uh, this uh, all the situation to the possibility of uh, decarbonizing and providing industrial goods that are fully uh, net zero. Okay. So uh, ideas on the on the on the area, but this is something that we, we we believe this could be a vision for for Brazil in the next next few years, as we call the providing of climate hub solutions. Uh, that's not that doesn't come. It comes with a price. No? I think the price is that there's a lot of investment potential. Investment is a positive, very positive aspect in, in driving the, the economy. We divided that in our study in two blocks. First blocks about two trillion uh, dollars of investments until 2050 uh, to achieve net zero. We believe also there's a potential of additional investment, of additional one trillion investments uh, to be what we call nature positive. Or say, or, uh, you know, abstracting more CO2 than uh, we our economy uses. Okay. Uh, that's quite a lot. That's uh, a significant amount of investment. In, in a levelized way, this would be more or less doubling the level of investment that uh, Brazil has. Okay, so there's a huge potential there. It's uh, quite a common place talking about the green potential that Brazil has. Uh, we as consultants try to put that we're very, we're, we're in, in Paris, we're in France, we're very Cartesian. On that, uh, on our on our assessment, we divided the, the opportunities in two, uh, in four critical pillars. Uh, the most important one, as you mentioned, that 50 percent of our uh, you know, challenges are related to to deforestation. This is also the single most important opportunity. So we have the opportunity to be the number one country in terms of uh, uh, reforestation, and 10 percent of natural-based solutions uh, could be provided for Brazil. Uh, as, as you mentioned, a lot of the, the facts we put here when we are updating this report is that can you have signs, can you have clear in indicators that uh, this, this agenda is advancing, and particularly examples of the private sector. So here we have the, the, the recent uh, announcements and, and projects that are already happening, uh, initiatives related to nature. The last one, last week, uh, uh, Microsoft signed a deal with Regreen. A very important project, very important initiative that you're going to be hear more about. Yeah. But uh, it, it's moving, okay? I think it's not a. A, a nature based solution is a very big challenge, a very critical challenge that we, we, we have here, the opportunities. Are, and, and we see the facts that uh, they are moving and they are driven by private sector. We have a biomas, we have other, other initiatives uh, that are not listed here, but uh, very important uh, movements on, on those areas, okay? Second big, biggest problem, biggest opportunity related to agriculture, no, or, 
Uh, and uh, I think Brazil is the number one uh, exporter of most agriculture commodities uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, regenerative practices are already being applied. Né? We have a huge problem in, in, the, in the protein, animal protein value chain uh, on that. Uh, but we believe that there is the opportunity of growing the production, uh, supporting the, the demand, additional demand that the world is requiring while reducing emissions. Okay, that's our, our vision. Part of that, and particular of that, you said, well, one third of Brazil area has been already uh, converted. And where we have pastures, two thirds of the pasture land shows some sort of degradation, okay, from severe to medium. So we have about 100 million hectares, 100 million uh, football fields uh, that uh, uh, sh should be uh, the, the opportunity to have the opportunity to be uh, converted and and, and, uh, and be used for additional productivity or, or grow in a more integrated way between uh, agriculture, uh, forest conservation and and, uh, and, and cattle raising. Uh, so we have the resources, we have the productivity. For example, Brazil in many situations we have the possibilities of two harvests. They call safrinha, in some cases up, up to three harvests. So, and and uh, uh, as I mentioned, advanced techniques, when I talk about the regenerative agriculture, there's not something new, okay? No till farming, which is one of the most important uh, regenerative agriculture techniques, uh, is part of the development of soil development in the, in the middle of the country, the Cerrado biome, uh, for more than 30 years. Uh, so when, when you talk about the, the opportunity here uh, of this degraded pasture recovery that, that we believe here, a lot of productivity increase both on the agriculture side or on the, on the cattle uh, side also, uh, besides what other techniques are, ve are very important. Why, why do we believe this is very, very critical on this, on this discussion? And of course, you're going to have the full, the full report and the, and the detail of this case here. But there are new business models already in place. Uh, if you talk like the uh, using uh, the recovering uh, 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 macaoba as a cultivation for biofuels, I think global demands and the global restrictions to demand also play an important role on the need to grow and to, to be more sustainable in the agriculture practice. Uh, and also uh, policies and funding being used, being converted to that, to that situation. Uh, this is a big challenge, okay? As, as you mentioned at the beginning, there's a big challenge in terms of uh, funding, all those share, all those development. Uh, there is a, the, the, the plan, the current plan, or rather committed to 40 million hectares. There's about 100 billion investment uh, uh, that are, that's required for that. And uh, we, we won't be doing financing that with traditional ways. We need concessional capital. Blended finance is very critical. Uh, and uh, and it will be uh, very demanded here. Uh, last week, uh, WWF and TNC uh, issue a report that we helped to prepare, particularly on that, that era, call for action re related to blended finance applied to the Cerrado region and, and recovery. So this is available on the report. You're going to have the link also going to be able to, to assess it. Renewable energy, I'm not going to be extending uh, a lot on, uh, here on the, on the opportunities and the, the situation we have already a leading uh, more than 90% renewable power. Uh, and, uh, and I think we, we also see the private sector moving in all different categories of uh, biofuels. We have the 2G uh, development of high easing, we have uh, HVO, and particularly SAF, uh, sustainable aviation as the key areas to, to be developed. So a lot of things happening on that area. And I think on the, on the hydrogen side, uh, yeah, a, a long list of projects, no? particularly uh, in the northeast of, northeast of Brazil. Uh, and we, we had a configuration of uh, exporting hydrogen derivatives, particularly to Europe. Also, uh, on Brazil Climate Zone last year, we issued a report on hydrogen uh, potential in Brazil, where we stressed also the, uh, the importance of local demand, the local industrial demand for that. And, and uh, we come to our last pillar, because we think there's a lot of potential here on having a, a green industrial products uh, solutions and alternatives. 
we have a power uh, matrix that's already renewable. If we have new technologies uh, to decarbonize also the industrial transportation use, we could have very important uh, requirements to comply with international regulations related to emissions that, uh, that are coming as the C-band here in Europe. Okay. So again, it's, normal, it's expected that the large conglomerates, the large companies in Brazil, large corporations have a focus on low emission products, no? being that on the, more on the uh, steel, mining, value chain, cement, but also on the, on the plastic verde is an old initiative of Brascain for many years. Just uh, in order to, to reach in here the, the time and this introduction, uh, there's two or three triggers, not a, I don't know, a walk in the park. I think there's a lot of things, a big challenge that have to be done. In particular, that we talk a lot about uh, green investment, green funding, but of, you know, most of the uh, funding today is going to projects in the development world, not so much flowing to, uh, to the let's say, emerging markets where most of the projects uh, should be happening. So that's one of the challenges. And, and again, also the sophistication of mechanism is still not fully captured on development, like green bonds development, something that we are lagging behind. Okay. So there's a little bit of converging funds to, to, to the development of these economies and also uh, to have also the, uh, the, the situation more, a more uh, integrated and, and a more uh, sophisticated uh, financial development mechanism as, as uh, green bonds financing. Uh, a little bit also the perspective we put there, how are we moving on that, uh, on that agenda? Uh, and I uh, think, you know, in a nutshell, it's uh, uh, the, the, the grass is not full. Uh, I think on the legislative side, I would say that's where it's more empty. We'd like much more speed and much more, uh, uh, I don't know, actions and transforming. I think it's good that the projects of laws are being discussed in Congress. On the other hand, uh, we we believe that uh, yeah, we're, they're not converting into law. Okay, so the, the it's it's a good initiative. I think on the executive side, we perceive uh, the plans, the, the transformation plans uh, we have going to be discussing that today. We have the agriculture plans, as I mentioned. We have the risking of uh, of uh, exchange rate on on green projects. So the positive move, I think, for international perspective, the key indicator, the KPI. 62% of reduction in, in Amazon deforestation, I think is the most important uh, point there. On the private sector, as I mentioned to you, there's several things happening, several positive uh, messages on that, and, and I think a real traction on, on, on the potential of the green market investment. Last slide, and this is a segue for uh, the, the presenters on, on the panel here that are much more interesting things to, to tell than, than I'm doing here. But a little bit on, on our, our reflection on what's the meaning of Brazil hosting uh, the G20 and, and COP30, okay? And I, I think that the, the key points here, ambassadors, ambassadors as was mentioned before, uh, Brazil has a, a diplomatic stance that's very important that can be explored. It's clear that uh, uh, Besides doing a showcase of, uh, of developments and a showcase of uh, how we can contribute to NDCs and solutions, the important thing here is that uh, I don't know, this, the movements in terms of climate cannot be done by one country, one single bloc, or, or it has to be a collective effort. Okay? So Brazil should use this capacity of speaking to the different, particularly the different blocs, uh, to advance that agenda that could be an excellent contribution for COP30 for the world. So, uh, as I mentioned to you, this is this is uh, uh, ready on our on our uh, on our website on the website of the event here. You can access the the the, the, the report. We'll be glad also to to talk to you later. But I like uh, Karina to to ask here and to prepare for the the stage. And I I change the role from presenter to moderator. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur, for this very interesting highlight of the huge potential that we, we have in Brazil. 
I think it's very interesting to see uh, the, the huge, uh, I would say, opportunities that we have there, but also to talk a little bit about the challenges that we, we see, right? So um, now I would like to call to the stage our experts uh, to add a policy and geopolitical perspective on the topic. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Minister Isabella Teixeira, former Minister of Environment of Brazil and co-chair of the United Nations International Panel on Environmental Resources and Senior Fellow at Arapio Institute. And also, please welcome Lawrence Chubiana, uh, President and CEO of the European Climate Foundation and former Climate Change Ambassador to France and the leader negotiator of the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very cozy here on the on the stage. So, thanks a lot, uh, Lohans. Um, I I I like to to start here, and I you know I'm speaking a lot, so it's a moderator. I don't have to make a lot of speech, but I I think we can start on the discussion here. On being in Paris is a pleasure being here, and we are here almost ten years after the Paris Agreement. Uh, of course, the geopolitical configuration of the world has had quite a lot of change. Okay, <laughs> so this, uh, so uh, we'd like to have your perspective, okay, on this, on these years, and what we can, what's your vision on on how dealing with climate on this new geopolitical situation? I'd like to start with uh, uh, Lohans and then uh, Isabella, okay? Are you sure? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you survive. <laughs> Anyway, I think uh, we will <coughs> we will converge enormously with Isabella, given the <laughs> the amount of conversation we have been having since since these last ten years. By the way, <coughs> I think of course uh, the there is no alignment of the stars like we had uh, before Paris, but again, um, if I must say so, because of course I'm very interested in the success of COP30. And I think Brazil can do a lot vis-a-vis -vis this very complex geopolitics we are facing. Uh, and you know, there is never a miracle in international relations. If you don't work on them, that things doesn't get better. And that's why I think, as you mentioned in your last remarks, the potential of Brazil reaching out to the different countries and different groups, in particular, of course, within the BRICS group, in the, within the G20 in particular, and I know how uh, important the G20 uh, is for the Brazilian government, pre Brazilian president, and I think it's a very good bet <coughs> not to take that as a sort of one meeting among many others, but a, w a place where you can change the relation between developed countries and uh, the big emerging ones. So, again, the context is difficult. There is a lot of trust, a lack of trust between uh, most developing countries and uh, the, the developed countries because many things, in particular the, <coughs> the COVID crisis that has really uh, alienated for good and bad reason many, many countries because of the nationalism that has in a way dominated the reaction to COVID. <coughs> the second element is of course uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, which uh, of course I, I know because I've discussed this with many friends in Brazil, have different uh, views, but you can imagine as uh, being European, you, you see what is what it is to have a war in, uh, in Europe, which is the first time since <coughs> the Second World War. And that, of course, the response uh, of US and Europe to the Ukraine war, and then of course now to the conflict uh, in Gaza, uh, is of course um, a major the interpretation of where the justice is, the double standards, many, many elements is uh, producing this lack of trust, plus finance, as you mentioned in your, in your presentation. So this is the context. So anyway, we cannot change it. <coughs> we cannot uh, call Putin to bring back his troops to Moscow. Unfortunately, I think it will facilitate the discussion. But that's what it is. And then what can Brazil do uh, in a way, in a moment where uh, I think Brazil has a lot of capacity to make a bridge? Because we have, unfortunately, uh, we would like maybe to climate change to be embedded in our conflict. But of course, that's totally irrational because climate change doesn't 
care about armies, doesn't care about frontiers, doesn't care about the geopolitics. So this dis disconnection between what we are facing together and the ability to respond collectively is a major challenge of our time. So that's why I think <coughs> there's different potential for Brazil to operate. But it's a choice. A choice to say, uh, look, uh, there are these conflicts, and we can list them, but there are areas of collective action we can develop from now. And that's why I hope that the Brazilian diplomacy will be ready to reach out to everyone to deliver. The, the first one is to deliver on um, uh, ambitious climate plans in G20, because of course that's where the problem is, is because we are not decreasing the emission enough for the developed countryside, and we are not decreasing emission on the global south side. So w something had to happen in G20 this year. Uh, with the example of Brazil showing his NDC, I understand, by the end of the year, and that incentivizing the other one just to do the same. And we cannot replicate what we have seen in Glasgow, where nothing happened really, and even in Dubai, nothing happened really in terms of improving um, the, uh, the, the plans and the investment. And the second element, of course, is finance. I think uh, Brazil has showed, again, enormous leadership in G20 on finance in general, because, of course, of this uh, breakthrough idea of having a, a tax on the richer people at the world level. And even if it uh, will be difficult, it is difficult. It's a minimum tax idea. But it raises the idea that we cannot have collective action with such a big inequality within countries that Brazil, no, is a very unequal country, uh, but it's true in many, many other countries. So I think that's a very, very strong thing. And I hope, together with what we have launched in Paris last June, having the global flows, aviation, maritime, maybe cryptocurrency and others, the ones who pollute really a lot and doesn't contribute, and that way I hope Brazil can bring uh, support as well and diplomacy. But I think it's a moment to, I, I, I understand the, the Troika logic, I understand the respect of <coughs> Brazil, let me be not totally diplomatic here, I understand the respect not to uh, anticipate the role for next year, but really we are running against time. So any informal context, any informal discussion, at, at least at that stage, would improve uh, the commitment of countries that are not there for the moment. So I'll stop there. Isabella? Uh, she's no. great, no? She's a badass. <laughs> <laughs> we are good friends, okay? <laughs> okay, I think that, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us together to be here. We are good friends. We have been since 10 years, yeah. uh, since Paris, before Paris, when I first met Laurence, it was in Peru, in Lima. Okay, you remember our first meeting with Fabius and yeah. uh, how the Brazil delegation came uh, to work together with French delegation and also our commitment to the Paris Agreement. I think that uh, I agree with her. Uh, we have a new world. If you compare all the geopolitical conditions that you have to achieve uh, Paris Agreements, they are over. And also with some additional uh, critical situations is the weakness of multilateral system. And this is a reality. Okay, remember that we used to play very well, considering uh, nine nations' uh, role. And today it's so complex. And the why it's complex? Because we have this issue is also be discussing outside the NFCCC. And this is very important to observe, because this means that we go into like-minded ge geopolitical blocks or economic blocks, like G20, like BRICS Plus, like OECD, like different ones around the world. And this means, in a practical world, practical in practical sense, that uh, we don't need to discuss all the requirements of the climate regimes, like CBDR, the Common but Differentiated uh, Responsibilities, that you use to separate developing developing countries. We don't need to con don't need to consider this this century when you go into these like-minded blocks. And this is very important to observe because this means. Um, and we have been discussed a lot together, that we need to land, ground, okay, the negotiations and understand the challenge that you have, uh, not only to mobilize countries and private sector and societies, but also and consider not only mitigation, <coughs> but adaptation, 
because we have the extreme events happening. But in my opinion, we need to change uh, the way to explore solutions. We need to bring countries that we did five countries that are able to provide solutions in the next five years. Okay, uh, the struggling that we have today that we need to run 1.5 Celsius degrees because this is important, but this is long term perspective. I'm not sure if Brazil will be well succeed, consider NDC diplomacy to convince all the countries in the world to be aligned with 1.5 Celsius degree for next year. Something like uh, Schalke, I, 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 have a, I, I have a green wishing to, have, to achieve 1.5, but I can manage concretely below 2 Celsius degrees. This means preserve Paris Agreement. And this is really a political, important political message that will happen in COP30. 10 years of Paris Agreement, and we will play additional 10 years of Paris Agreement. This is, I used to call this, uh, to name this as transition climate politics how we move the pieces, consider the countries that are able to provide solutions in different fields, in different areas, and also to make clear that there is no comfort zone. And it's a good example for Brazil also, because we have deforestation, deforestation, you no know, economic carbon, etc., etc., but when you come with the international political commitment, the President Lula assumed that zero deforestation by 2030, and let's assume that it will become a reality, but in international negotiations, where Brazil will be responsible after 2000, beyond 2030, to admit only scenarios of decarbonizing, decarbonization considering no de deforestation. So this means that mitigation of the economic sector will be absolutely strategic. And so private sector must be engaged. And I'm not discussing financial sector. I'm discussing the productive sectors, okay? Who are, who are, which ones are the leaders of global supply chains? and how the private sector must be engaged, the productive. I, I don't like the idea that it's only finance, okay? We need to understand how the supply chains will come, well, how we need to change things, the business model, et cetera, et cetera, and of course, the realities that will be under pressure to be transformed, and also international trade. Private sector in Brazil, which used to be su submitted to some situations that you know have been discussed a lot, considering some barriers trade over barriers based on traceability, for example, in deforestation, but private sector preserve the access of the markets when you go to this, this debate. But nobody discuss about costs <coughs> and how the markets, the consumers will pay for this. Here you know that there is no conditions to pay for this today. Okay, and this means an unbalanced situation when you go to mobilize people, our common interests, uh, to be committed to cut emissions and also at the same time be resilient and be prepared to be a less risk society in the future, consider the business and development and markets and consumers, etc., etc. So there is an asymmetry when you go into geopolitical games and this is very interesting, interesting to observe because I'm not sure how the emerging economies will come together with us because we're part of the same uh, field and we go to mitigation, okay? Uh, if uh, they are committed to run 1.5 Celsius degree in this is ambition for the next year. I'm not sure about this because I have been exposed to different debates. We have been together. Yeah. And uh, it's not concrete for me if Brazil diplomacy will be able mm -hmm. to mobilize, okay, key countries. <coughs> 20 is a good example, okay. We have to have 8% of the global emission there, okay. And uh, what are the the deals that must be promoted between private sector and society, that will be sure that you can move the pieces in that direction. This is different from what's happened by 2015, uh, when not only multilateral system was so important, but the dialogue between countries, between governments, will be very important. So Brazil had bilateral agreements to achieve our ambition, uh, consider uh, INDC by, 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 uh, to be delivering Paris conference in COP21. And these bilateral agreements engaged China at the head of states, engaged President Obama, Merkel, and also Norway. Okay, and we agree how we should come together bilaterally mm. consider climate change. I don't know anything about this happening today in Brazil. Okay, or else, I, I probably I don't know, I, I'm not access the right source of information because we have different uh, layers, okay, but uh, 
there is no movement. I go to China, we discuss with our friends. There is no movement that we can have bilateral agreement, bilateral movements. Probably now, as this year is, I'm sure I have been engaged to Jackson some uh, tracks, uh, considering the fifth anniversary of bilateral cooperation be between Brazil and China, that will mean something. I hope so. I really hope so. But this means it's not only considering the governments. You must invite private sector to understand which role they must play. And this means, as you used to discuss in the past, and President Obama used to say this, this means political education process for the stakeholders that you don't have today happening in the world. We, this is based on tragedy. It's like uh, we are, that's why you have so three huggers around the world, okay? And you have green wish into the room. We need to be pragmatic. We need to understand that this COP, the next COP, I'm a advisor of the Baku uh, <coughs> chair. I'm trying to figure out what's happened there. Uh, but w w it's very important what to be delivered in COP29 in such a way that Brazil could play a really strategic role. And I'm worried about uh, the lack of the political rooms to invite different players, nationally different ones, to dialogue and to understand the dimension of the challenges that are on the table. We have uh, different challenges, and in my, to my <coughs> perspective, I believe that uh, uh, you should understand better what we as society should come to make sure, together, to make sure that uh, we have some critical issues to be solved if you want to move the peace the next 10 years. <laughs> so Brazil has a huge responsibility, not only because we have G20 or BRICS Plus, we have more than 107 meetings of BRICS Plus booked for next year, 170 efficient meetings. Nobody knows <laughs> what has happened there. Well, no, is this tell me, anyone here know no. what BRICS agenda no. is? That's, well, no, no, no. <coughs> this is the real world, okay? So is let's it? land it, let's open the Pandora box, without carbon, okay, <laughs> and let move the piece in the right direction. If not, again, you have a COP without a pragmatic approach that you need to manage the next 10 years. I, I, I know this, is, this was a very, a very challenging and, and, and I think enlightening discussion here. Uh, we have on this co conference, we created those expressions like road to Belen, okay. I'd like you to explore a little bit you both on, is there a silver lining on that? What could be positive? aspects and uh, things that, I don't know, we're talking here about investors, what they should be watching on this road to Berlin. I think, <coughs> uh, and, and again, uh, sometimes it's necessary to look at things that look negative as positive. I, I, I'm talking about, in particular, trade. Uh, you were referring on the, in your slides about the, <coughs> the constraint on the European market on um, imported deforestation. I think this should be, uh, trade could be in the road to Belém. And because I, again, uh, and I know uh, how much Isabella has influence on that, when uh, the previous government decided to, what well, was, thinking about uh, leaving the Paris Agreement, I think you convinced many of the private sector not to do that. Why? Because of the market. And I think there is an element, a positive element to, to use Again, that's, uh, you know, the diplomacy can be like judo as well. Huh? You feel that it is a negative thing against you, but you can tack at a positive element to uh, accelerate the transformation in-house, in, in Brazil, and get the, will be, as you uh, argue, the green power, in, even in pro producing food at scale, for the global markets. And that comes from that bilateral potential discussion as well, and it, of course, there are different demands out there, but you can say, finally, uh, raising the norms and trying to learn something on trade in, in, Brazil, in, in, in COP, in Belém, as a way to improve the condition of the market, I think would be a, an interesting move from the investors and, of course, the agro, agro sector, agro business, as well as the farmers. As then. I think it's the same on the... I, many of my Brazilian colleagues are protesting uh, uh, against CBAM, for example, that why are you doing that? It's totally protectionist. And I see that now more and more uh, colleagues from China or India saying, why don't we use CBAM for us? Meaning putting an export tax 
uh, that will allow you to uh, Brazil to pick up the resources and invest in the greening of your supply chain, like green steel, for example, very good example. I think the Indian would do that. Again, I think that's the way you see that because it's, uh, as Isabella is saying, the, the problem and the value is that it can't be in the UNFCCC framework. We are in implementation of Paris. Paris is about uh, finance, so the, the financial system, it's about the sectors, whether it's in industry, agriculture, energy. So it's not in the negotiators of climate which is happening. It is happening on the ground. And this is global transformation, the whole of government approach. What I appreciate in your ecological plan, transition plan, but of course it has to be consistent with the whole economy in Brazil, which I don't think we are there for the moment, if I may say so, because of course you have a lot of, you are the fifth uh, export of uh, oil and gas, oil, if I'm, I'm not wrong. And so you, you have tension into even the economic system and the way it brings resources to the country. So I, I would say if Brazil can bring uh, an economic perspective to the road to Belém, that will be the clear signal that anyway, this transition which is happening, this low carbon transition is happening. I, I think the same to my European colleagues would say, oh, it's going too fast, we can't do that. It is happening. China has decided almost 10 years ago or even more to go in that direction. So if we don't want to be behind the, the curve, we have to go there and to use Belém as a way of acceleration, this transformation of the whole economy. So how make, and I will stop there, how make Belém significant? Well, it's a way to bring the local government, the industry, the private sector at the table, but not with nice commitments on the side, uh, as it happened in many COPs um, after Paris, but really bringing them with serious accountability that they participate to that transformation. So it means that a different relation probably between government and all these private sector initiatives to have them uh, make a consistent about the transformation, working on the different levels. And if we had that, of course, which is a different style of diplomacy. It's a, what I call the 360 degrees diplomacy. You talk to business as well as civil society, as well as local governments. Uh, and that's important. Finally, I think, uh, and I think unfortunately, Brazil has to take this probably with much more uh, energy or, or you know, understanding that before adaptation, uh, to be a, clean, a green power, you mean that it's not in the same climate condition, unfortunately. And how to understand this need of adaptation, which was not, in my view, at the forefront of the discussion, but I think it, it may change totally the, the global economy of Brazil because of the, these elements, not only the floods, but the uh, drought, and you have, I think, witness, uh, in, if I understand, even this year and last year, which were very severe, even in a country where you don't imagine you would lack of water, but it happened, so. Oh, I agree. I think uh, I'd like to highlight three or two different points here to contribute for the debate. We need new adults into the room, okay? And they are not f environmentalists. Yeah. This is very important. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, uh, my constituency is not enough. Okay, to deal with the challenge that climate change, tech climate change means. This means when you have Rio 92, you have science as a political player, and today you really a strategic political player that nobody pays attention enough. After this, you have the environmentalism hosting <coughs> this agenda, and now it's geopolitical, economic development, technology, etc. So we need to improve the languages and tools, how we have not only the engagement, but the co-responsibility. The choice of a country like Brazil must have deals behind the scenes. Don't think that to have some uh, brilliant people in this planet of ministerios locked in the rooms that you modeling plans and say that this is our ambition without political deals with society. Forget it, okay? When we, I prepare, I was responsible to prepare for the Paris Agreement, you have really deals, political deals with all the economic sector that matter, all of them. 
But I didn't have the ambition to uh, give news for the newspapers so everyone knows that what I, do, what I was doing. No, we work hard. So I think that today you have really something not enough in process because the private sector was not called last year. It's calling now after pressure that we're doing. They're coming now. And indeed, what are the conditions together with National Congress that must be agreed in such a way that you can come as a really uh, one society that understand our responsibility, our role. So here you explain this when you have some bills considering uh, biofuels, et cetera, et cetera, in National Congress. And uh, my second point here is that, please, there is, as I was trying to mention in the first uh, session, the first moment, is that uh, there is no comfort zone. And this means that uh, Brazilians like to say our renewable uh, energy mix, our renewable energy electric mix, forget it. Okay, we need to play consider the future. It's not Brazil back, it's the future back. We are discussing the future. We are not discussing the past. Okay, even the past is not is not more than it used to be. Okay, like Renato Russo, a famous rocker star in Brazil, that's a politician of mine used to say. Okay, I, I can show you the thing. It's very nice, and um, the song is very nice. So, so it's true. It's sometimes uh, my feeling is that we have an illogical and digital political moment in Brazil today. It's an erratic movement. If the world is a mess, we need to understand it is. It's complex, okay, really complex, but also fascinating because we need to criticize politics as really something very interesting. But we need to understand that we have 71% of the global population that <coughs> live today under no democ democratic regimes or governments. 50% of the global GDP they are generated by non-democratic countries. Okay, take care. The world is changing. The debate here in France, okay, what is happening? The debate, I, the last ten, year, 10 days I was, this is my fourth international dialogue, okay, and uh, in 10 days. And I was in Germany, etc., with the, the chancellor, para -da, para -da. so it's impressive how the societies are coming to deal with climate change and how, which one, which, which are the tracks that you should put our coins. And this is not clear in the country like Brazil. And I can give an example. Uh, the most important economic sector that will fix solutions in Brazil is exactly agriculture sector, okay? Together with forests. Schalke is with deep eyes, remember us, okay? <laughs> uh, it was really a good, good uh, uh, player, the forest sector, when we prepare our NDC by 2015. Okay, they develop all the scenarios that they need. It was very interesting. But look, uh, we need to end this process that uh, agriculture uh, is a polarized uh, economic sector that likes to polarize with the environment. But first of all, we need to bring this together again. We have 208 million of hectares, something under the domain of agriculture sector in Brazil. What it means, it's not only crops. They had nature there. Capture, the value of capture, natural capital in Brazil is under the domain of, of agriculture. It's impressive how my constituents want to say, we are against you. We are not against you. You cannot provide solutions without a robust partnership with the agricultural sector in Brazil. If you want to value natural capital, natural capital, if you want to come in biofuels, if you want to be a solution provider. It's a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake. Okay, and I know this because I have to deal with forest code, and we include forest code in INDC. And that's why agriculture set preserved Paris Agreement. Brazil is a part of Paris Agreement during Bolsonaro government. My Minister Teresa Cristina shared with me all the moments that, all the debates about this. Behind the scenes, of course, no? <laughs> so what is this? Is this that we need to and up this process to fragmented things because we need to be together with a new vision about our future. If you come to discuss the future in Brazil, please, it's not a linear projection of the past. Okay? If you come in agriculture in Brazil, agriculture means a strategic role considered climate security, uh, climate uh, food security, energy security. 
is the only country that can combine different dots as a bridge, bridge builder and also change makers and also a broker. You can, you can be disruptive considering technology development, but still we are discussing that to have 9% of renewable energy, parara, parara, and what's happening with the finance, Luciano, what's happening with renewable wind, wind energy in office, the crisis that we have with private sector, et cetera, et cetera, the tariff, parara, parara, parara. Come on, let's rethink things. It's impressive. Don't forget it, that you have mantras that, that you had in the past that will preserve us in the future. It's over. I'm sorry, but it's over. We need to work hard really hard to have solutions, I agree, but we need scalability, we need uh, trust, we need markets, we need new business models. Who will pay for the risks? Who will pay for the risks? Nobody discuss it. It's like in a, a what's happening in, a, in, in, in Rio Grande do Sul. Finally, finally, Brazil woke up that is not Amazon region. Finally, because you have our lobby, our green lobby, it's like Amazonia is a critical issue <coughs> for climate change. Also, but Brazil needs to understand that we need to deal with climate change. Unfortunately, we, are, we have this old cup based on a tragedy. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the costs are so high. Have been discussing this in BNDES. It's impressive. Okay, it's more than Katrina, so it take more than 20 years or 10 years. Let's see what's happening. It's 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 bigger than Katrina. Okay, so and the Katrina after 10 years in Katrina, I was there. The poor people, the, poor, the black poor people, they didn't have access to the house yet. Ten years later, now twenty years. No, so next year. So I think that we need to understand that the world is changing. In we have the society, the global society, a movement, different flows, and Brazil changed. Observe this. It's not what happened ten years ago. It was an Ivana. I convinced this. It was better that we had the past, that we have today. Okay, the political condition. But this is how we need to manage things. So my feelings is that observe democracy, what's happening in Brazil, the political parties, not to be conservative, it's not a problem, but we need to understand our choice. Denialism, something that must be outside of the, of the room. Okay? And the climate denialism. But we need to be pragmatic. We need to understand that our scenarios, if we're looking forward to address development, we need to understand that to have new conditions. For example, to produce food in a country that without Brazil is impossible to deal with <coughs> food security and hunger eradication in the world. Okay? And so understand what is happening, understand how we can come together concerning international cooperation understand how we need to be product productivity and also how much we con have competitiveness because of the country they don't have this. That's why incentives, you have protectionism, etc. But we need a pragmatic approach to dialogue with people. And, and, and I'm Isabella, worried, I'm sorry, I'm just worried. To I'm to finish, okay. I have 45, <laughs> no, I have one minute. Because yeah. but, you, but, you know but, that but, we no, but, but First no, of all, dude, I, I'm, 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 so, I'm so fortunate that, uh, that it's been recorded, okay, because okay. it's such a good insight. But, but just on the, on the last. You, you, you present you 30 minutes, you need to present 10 minutes, you use 10 minutes more. I took note. I took note. <laughs> but, but I know, you know how to matter. But no, I but went but, but, uh, but I, no, uh, my suggestion to you on the, on the last comments here, if you have, if you have a, a tweet to send to President Lula, what to do both I don't send a tweet to President Lula. I was with foreign minister. Okay. I can, I can have an informal meeting with President okay. Lula. Okay, on, on, on a one-on-one -on -one okay. meeting. Okay. <laughs> but if you want a tweet, <coughs> not for President Lula, for Brazil. But what would be the key? Is, key is let's discuss the future. Forget the past. At least uh, we can... Country, I think what would be really important is in the political discussion in Brazil that climate change is not against development. To, to tackle climate change is not against development, it's a condition. If not, you would not be the green power, you would ru ruin your agriculture as well, and that's just a proof. And that, I think, could make things very different if we just don't oppose this dis discussion, which is totally unscientific, irrational, but really polarized in the political debate. So it is. Discuss the future. Today. I, I, I like without very much. Agreeing, without the green wishing, please. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, and do it. And land your scenarios here, okay? okay. Land your numbers. Land. Okay. okay. That, that, that's the key. That's the key challenge. And that's why we have this audience. And, 
Well, thanks a lot. I think it was very enlightening I'm, I'm discussion. Thank you very much. You are so a hero, no? So <laughs> he survived. <laughs> and and uh, and uh, we have a lot of panels here, so we finish on. I think we have to finish on time. It's been great and great content, and it's recorded. Okay. Thanks a lot again. Okay.